Welcome to the Powerlifting and Power Ballads podcast, where we bring you a weekly dose of powerlifting news, tips, and training advice with a touch of 80s rock ballads. This podcast is presented by Team Roar Powerlifting, your source of the most comprehensive coaching and meet day preparation. Here are your hosts, Josh Roar and Laura Sturm. All right, welcome to episode 108. We are joined today by Katie Jones. I want to give you a few things uh, from her bio. Katie, fill me in if I missed anything. You are the Kansas State Chair, State Referee, me Director, Gym Owner, and Coach. Uh, you recently just qualified for Raw Nationals again, and you have your pro bench card, and you just tore your hamstring. What the hell? <laughs> well, it was like four whole weeks ago, so you know I'm doing better now. That's good. Um, on that note, so what is your what is your thought process and mentality when stuff like that happens? Cause that's not the first time that happened to you and injuries are part of the game. Like you, you compete train long enough, something's going to happen. Um, I know most people, their strategy is feel sorry for themselves and sit around and rest and do nothing. Yeah. Absolutely. That's strategy. That's terrible. That's a terrible strategy. That's probably the worst thing that you can do. And I think, um, you know, a lot of it is perpetuated by the medical industry. You know, you go in and you see a doctor, especially somebody who's never lifted a weight in their life. And, and you tell them, Hey, I, you know, pulled a quad, you know, squatting or whatever. And they're like, well, just don't squat. Like, you know, and what that, that doesn't work for me. And that doesn't work for a majority of the population. So, um, I have uh, found a really good physical therapist, number one, that I absolutely adore and who is all about like, hey, let's get you back to doing what you love, pain and injury free. And that's their priority. Um, so they're not going to, you know, if you're a long distance runner, they're not going to go in and tell you, well, just stop running and your feet will flow. But you know what I mean? So they're very much about um, meeting you where you're at and making sure that uh, you're taking the appropriate steps to get you back to where you want to be. So um, that, that that's the first thing that I would do as an athlete is just find somebody that you have in your back pocket who you can trust and you can rely on for that type of advice. So, um, I've got a great physical therapist. Um, the last, I, I had the benefit of hindsight this time because I'd torn my hamstring before and, um, actually the other hamstring I've now torn both hamstrings. Uh, and just so everybody knows I tore it playing softball, not powerlifting. So, uh, you, you get good at what you do. And unfortunately I don't play softball all that often. So I'm not very good at it. Um, hence, you know, the muscles aren't used to, to doing that type of work. Um, and that's why I tore my hamstring both times. So, um, but, uh, the last time I tore my hamstring, I, you know, I stayed off of it. Um, I, I did see somebody and he was like, yeah, you should probably keep it mobile. And that was, I mean, good advice. Like I was on the recumbent bike, you know, maybe 10 days after it happened and I was trying to, you know, keep things moving. And I think the last time I tore it, it was a bit more severe than this time. Um, so there, you know, there, there's differences in the injury, but this time, like I was, I was on the bike the very next day I was, you know, making sure like 30 minutes after it happened, I was pumping my leg, you know, I was making sure I was keeping that joint mobile, um, and trying to get as much blood flow through the area as possible. And then after that, it was really just a matter of gauging my pain levels and doing whatever I was able to do on that given day. And each and every day, it just got better and better and better. And so I did more and more and more. And here we are four weeks later and I just, you know, deadlifted, what was it like 135 the other day. So, um, I think that's a huge part of it. And I think people, I think being still is one of the worst things you can do. Um, and I know, you know, sometimes things happen that don't allow you to, to walk or to run or to, you know, move in certain ways, like a break is much different than a tear, but, um, there are definitely things that you can and should be doing. And I think it's just, the whole rice method, you know, rest, ice, compression, elevator, whatever, it, it's just completely antiquated, you know, and, and we know better and we should be doing better by now. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people just, that's still, it's almost like the, you know, the old school football coaches, like, well, that's what we did when I played. So that's what you're going to do now. We're going to go run, you know, three miles for conditioning for football. Well, we, you know, we rest, ice, elevation, compression, right? That's the, that's not, that's the old school thought process. That's not, not necessarily as effective. So yeah, I agree. Um, hey, so, so a little, a little more, uh, just cause partially I don't know, but, uh, how'd you get started in powerlifting? 
Um, I was a bodybuilder. Actually, when I first started out weightlifting, um, I started my fitness journey probably about 12 years ago. And uh, I was on bodybuilding.com with like 90% of the population. So I did a uh, uh, Jamie Eason's Live Fit Trainer. That was my very first program that I ever ran. And I had just super good results from it. Um, loved bodybuilding for a while. And then I decided I really like eating food. So um, stopped bodybuilding. And my coach at the time, uh, Alberto Nunez, he's with um, Team 3DMJ. He uh, he was super big into the compound list. Like he loved programming bench squat and deadlift. And so we did that every single week, even though I was uh, a bodybuilder. And uh, I really fell in love with them. And I knew I knew I was pretty strong for my size. And so that was another factor. I like to be I like to be good at what I do. And I like to be competitive. I'm a I'm an athlete at heart. So um, when I figured out like, hey, I can. I can compete and still, you know, eat like that. That was a huge draw for me, you know, making the leap from bodybuilding to, to powerlifting. Um, and powerlifting is just one of those things that just allows me to be super, you know, consistent. And, um, I'm, I'm kind of boring and like, I like doing the same things over and over again and getting, getting better and being able to show that I'm getting better. Like that's, that's kind of what sparks me to, you know, keep driving and keep pushing forward. So, so yeah, that's how I got started. And that's one thing I'll say too, like, I love, so I, for those that don't know, like I'm your coach now uh, for powerlifting. How did that come about? First of all. Uh, so I am also a USAPL club coach um, and you coached me for my club coach certification way back where I think we were in Houston or somewhere, somewhere down there in Texas. Um, so, you know, that was seven, seven or eight years ago. I can't remember when, but um, I, I knew you from that. I had followed you. Um, and then when I went to nationals yet yeah, last year, well, two years ago now, um, I just saw your name everywhere and I saw your athletes everywhere. And I'm like, this guy knows his shit. Like I'm going to, you know, I, I want, I want to learn from people that have been there, done that and are where I want to go. And if you, you know, if I aspire to be a national level athlete, then I need a coach who knows how to get people there. And that was really my main impetus for hiring you was like, Hey, he's got athletes here. He knows, you know, the ropes, he knows how it goes. And I believe he can get me there. Yeah. And I think it's interesting too. Like, um, you're a powerlifting coach yourself and you have a coach. And I think there's a, there's still a stigma around that. I think like, if you're a coach, you don't need a coach. People think that. And I think that's ridiculous. Um, myself as an example, like I'm a complete moron when I'm trying to train myself because I just want to lift heavy and not do all the little stuff. So like, I don't coach myself either. Um, when I do, I usually end up hurting myself because I just do what I feel like doing. Right. Um, so having somebody that's objective, that can look at things and, and not be influenced by the, you know, the desire to, Oh, I feel like lifting heavy today. I feel like doing this. I'm going to not do this. Um, but one thing I was going to say, I was starting to say earlier, like one thing I appreciate about you is you do all the little things. So like when, you, when you do your program, like you put in all the details, you put in all your videos, like little comments here and there. And I think that adds up over time. Like sometimes just cutting corners, like, well, I'm just going to skip the last couple sets of my assistance work today. Cause I don't feel like doing it now. Granted things come up like time constrictions and things like that, where you have to kind of modify stuff, but that's never been and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm putting you on the spot here, but I've never got that from you where you're trying to cut corners on anything. Well, and I think, I think that's a coach thing though. Cause like I'm a coach and I appreciate it when my athletes do what they're told to do. Like you hire me for a reason. Like I hired you for a reason. Why would I not do what you tell me to do and, and cutting corners and skipping sets and you know, whatever. Like even when I'm like, man, Josh, I don't know why the fuck you want me to do barbell shrugs, but damn it. I'm, I'm going to go and do them. Like that's like it, it is what it is. And I know I can ask you at any time too. And you'd be like, this is why we're doing this. And that's also some, you know, you, if you don't trust your coach, I think it's a lot easier to cut corners and cut, you know, some of those things out and to just, you know, let a few things go here and there. But if you believe in the program and you want to get to that next level, then you should be doing whatever your coach tells you to do, like whether you understand it or not. And if you don't understand it, then you should go and ask for clarity for sure. Yep, absolutely. And you as a coach, as an example, like you're always asking questions and trying to learn as well, too. And I think that's one thing that people, coaches specifically, try to get to a point where they're like, well, I know everything and don't question me. And I think that is the point where that coach needs to be fired. Like if they, if a coach isn't continually trying to learn and get better, then they're going backwards. And there's so many people I know like that. And it drives me crazy because – I'm not going to go on too big of a rant here, but there's so many coaches I know that just, they, they 
put in the minimal effort, like they get to a certain point and they're just like, okay, I know all I need to know. And they just never continue to grow as a coach. And that just, I don't know, it bothers me. Um, anyway, this is turning into like Josh's gripe fest today, but that's all right. Um, here, I'll let you gripe for a little bit. Here's a question. Um, are men better powerlifting coaches than women? I can see both sides of it. And I think it really depends on the athlete. Like some athletes need somebody to be super in tune. Like a lot of, a lot of my athletes are women and, um, they need somebody to ask them, you know, how's your life going? How are your stress levels? How are, and I think sometimes that's kind of lost on men, not all the time, but sometimes, um, because it does matter, you know, and there's stress is cumulative, no matter where it's coming from, whether it be training stress or life stress or, you know, lack of sleep stress or whatever it is. And I think sometimes not all women, but some women can be a lot better at the, the softer skills, I think than men. Um, but that's definitely not always the case. So I, I think it depends on the athlete and what kind of coach they're looking for and what they really need. You know, I've had some athletes who um, have actually quit coaching with me because I asked for too much information and they're like, I just want the programming and you need to shut up. And I'm like, that's not, that's not how I work. That's not how I roll. So if you just want somebody to, you know, sling you numbers, then I'm not your coach, you know, and, that, and that's fine. You know, everybody needs to find what works for them. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's a, a better or worse thing. And I definitely don't think it's male or female. I think it's a, a personality thing. In general, I was expecting you to be way more offended at that question. The, so I think Sam Calhoun posted that question a couple of weeks ago and it was, it was not that exactly. It was something like, why do why do men have trouble being coached by women? Is, is that even a, a thing? Uh, and I think, I think to a degree it is. Um, and I guess I don't know why. I'm not easily offended first and foremost, but secondly, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's definitely a stigma that men know more than women. And if you're at a higher level, then you need to be with, you know, a male coach, um, but I also think women are fairly new to the powerlifting scene and we don't have as much experience. So there's, there's two sides to every coin. And I don't, I think the, I do think it has a lot to do with the, you know, we haven't been around the sport as long as men have. So there's that as well. Yeah. I don't know. I could almost argue the opposite and, and just for fun, I will. Um, I think because of, for whatever reason, the stigma, I think a lot of times if you have two coaches that, a male coach and a female coach that are, you know, semi viewed as equal. I would almost bet that the female coach is better, um, more qualified, has uh, more education or something. Just it kind of bothers me. Like I, I'm not obviously I'm not a female coach, so like I, I really don't. I guess it's not directly affecting me, but it, it, it's when I see really good coaches, female coaches specifically, like talking about how you know, their experiences where this athlete didn't want to work with me because of this or, or whatever. And I'm just like, I just don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand it. So. Yeah. And I can see that. And if, like I said, if I was a person who was easily offended, it would probably offend me, but yeah. it doesn't. I, was, I was trying to offend you there. I was trying to get a little reaction, but eh, I no, I'm, to. you know, I'm, I'm a female in a very male dominated industry, especially here in Wichita. And, uh, I, I have never taken to the oh, I should get the same opportunities as somebody else, even though I'm a female. Like that that whole conversation is not like, to me, if you want something, you better go and prove it. And even if you have to work a little bit harder than somebody else to get it, like, that's fine. Like, but you're not just going to be handed things, you know? And even if you have to dig out of the trenches a little bit, like, that's what you got to do. And once you prove yourself, people are going to, you know, jump on board, but you, you got to prove it, you know? And I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. All right, let's shift gears. IPF bench rule. So the new rule is you have to have your elbows go at least to the top of the shoulders. So basically bench depth. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's absolutely no way you can judge that like consistently. There's absolutely no way. And if you can't judge something consistently, you can't make a rule against it. So that's that's just where I'm at with the whole thing. It's like I mean, squat depth, honestly, everybody always bitches about squat depth and that not being judged consistently. But like, I mean, I just, I just think there's absolutely no way, especially with all the other things they're supposed to be watching and looking at and 
you know, judging already, like there's just no way that that's going to be judged consistently at all. Yeah. So I don't know. I, my very first reaction was I absolutely hate it. I think it's a stupid rule. I think if somebody can get, if somebody works hard enough to get into a position to arch um, where, you know, they have a, a, a two inch range of motion, then congrats. They worked within the rules to do that. Um, however, I have been, it, I, it's been growing on me a little bit, um, but I think it's growing on me for the, for the wrong reasons. So I think, again, I'm speculating the, I think the reason for the rule was to make it more understandable to the general public. And I know one of the big goals of the IPF, at least what they tell people is to get into the Olympics, which I won't get into that because that's not really their real goal. Um, but anyway, um, you know, to make it more, to make it more understandable to the general public is, is part of that um, part of that mission, I guess. But, you know, the, the, going back to the judging thing, even, even the head coming off the bench rule, like for the, in the IPF, like how many times do you see one red light from the chief referee and two whites from the side because the side can't see it? Well, if you're looking at the elbow depth and here's, here's the other thing of that, it has to be both sides of the elbows have to hit depth. So if you're watching from the chief ref side and let's say, or from the chief ref position, and let's say one side doesn't hit depth, quote unquote depth, right? You give a red light. Can the side referees see that even? And I actually set up, I actually set up a couple, uh, just to test this out, had people in, in chairs and, and a lot of times you're the side referees are literally looking down the arm with the elbow, looking at the elbow first. So that the entire shoulder girdle is blocked by the forearm and the elbow. Um, so in that case, as the side ref, you would almost have to move if that's what you're trying to watch, but then you actually lose view of, you know, the butt coming up, potentially the bar touching the chest, um, there's just so many things. And I, I think it's going to end up being a, a situation where there's going to be a lot of red lights from the chief ref, but still good lifts from the side because they just can't, they can't see it or can't tell, which again, does that really change anything? I don't know. Not really. Um, I don't know. And, and then the flip side of that is people that don't really understand the sport. They're going to see somebody come down pause, press it back up and get red lights because they didn't hit depth and wonder, well, why didn't, why didn't they get, a, get it because they came all the way down. Um, so I don't know. I'm still, you know, I started out really hating it. Um, I still don't like it, but it's grown on me a little bit. So I'm kind of, kind of in a weird limbo with it. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know how I feel about it yet. Do you Holy. think it's going to, I've been asked this, do you think it's going to trickle down from the IPF to the USAPL. The only way it'll trickle down to the to the other organizations in USA Powerlifting, I think, is if it just if it just ends up being like the next greatest thing and everybody loves it, then I think I can I could see it being adopted. Um, but I don't see that happening. I think there's so many people already outspoken about it and they don't like it. Um, and personally, I, I I don't I don't see the problem. Like the 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 whole point the rules have always been, you know, move the bar from point A to point B with these parameters, you know, butt on the bench, shoulders on the bench, et cetera. And if you can, uh, can contour your body to a position that allows a very short range of motion, again, that's, that's props to you for taking the time to work on that, uh, that aspect of it. So I don't know. I, I, I don't think it'll trickle down. Um, like I said, the only, the only way I can see it actually, being adopted is if it just ends up being like everybody's just like wow this is such a great change and blah 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 then then i could see it possibly being being brought in but i don't i don't think so it doesn't affect me because you know i go to full bench depth every time yeah and right same here I, that's because i have like freaking long long ass <laughs> arms but here's here's another thing i was thinking about though so if that applies to you, the, the bench rule, you probably have pretty short arms in general, which means you, your deadlift is probably your weakest lift. If we're now restricting the bench pressers, 
I think they're at a significant disadvantage in a full powerlifting meet because now they have their bench press restricted and their deadlift is already, you know, their, their arms are already shorter. So they have poor leverages for that. So I think, I think that's going to be, so that, that's where the other argument came up. I, I, I don't know. I, I, sometimes I usually stay off social media, but occasionally I go down a rabbit hole and then there's a lot of people like, okay, well, you know, if we're restricting the bench rule, we need to actually ban sumo now because it's, it's a double disadvantage for lifters that have short arms. And so it's kind of like, well, where does it end? Like, you know, then, then you can almost argue, well, you know, a six foot five lifter has to squat down two feet versus a five foot lifter that only squats down, like, you know, less than a foot. Should there be a minimum amount of distance the bar has to squat? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, where does it end? And I just, I don't know. I think this is a slippery slope with this rule and, and restricting what's universally been the standard of performance since powerlifting began and now limiting limiting that is uh i don't know i think it's a it's an interesting change and i'm i'm expecting it to not to go over well in the long term but i don't know like maybe it maybe it becomes the next greatest thing and everybody loves it and that's the way it goes in the future do you have do you have athletes that plan to compete in the ipf that you're having to transition to this type of lifting and how how would you go about that as a coach um, I, I do have a few, but none of them are affected. I don't think because none of them have the crazy, crazy arch or, or extreme short arms. So, um, I don't think it affects me, but you know, if, if it did, I mean, it would really just be, you know, it dep- so there's two, twofold, it's twofold. Um, if it's an equip lifter, we probably still want to try to keep a max width grip, um, because of the, using the equipment. So that would be a situation where we would just have to work on more of a flat back uh, bench and less arch. If it's a raw lifter, then I would probably keep the, keep the extreme arch and try to bring the grip in a little bit. Um, Again, everybody's individual, but just as a, if I'm giving a general rule on how we would approach that, that would probably be the starting point. Well, when I first heard that rule, I was worried more about safety, like shoulder safety, preventing injury. Like that, that's the first thing that came to mind was, well, sh- man, now all these people are going to, you know, have to bring their grip in or, you know, we can't have the shoulders in a compact position. Like, you know, what does that look like? So that was where my head went first and foremost. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. I honestly, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, you're right. Like there is going to, it'd be an interesting case study, like just see how many more shoulder injuries there are now versus before, because that is one of the main reasons for arching is yeah lift more weight shorter range of motion etc but it does very much protect the shoulders so that would be interesting to track and see how that how that plays out um here's another question for you uh you know this podcast is really not structured (laughs) but we we do we do like to talk about music do you have a preferred music type or song or anything that you train to and or compete to I'm really eclectic. Like some days it'll be like Incubus. Other days it'll be, um, I really like NF a lot. Um, so, you know, more like the Christian rap, uh, he's a Christian rap artist. Um, I listen to worship music sometimes. Like it really just depends on the mood. Um, I'm not a big rock fan. Like I don't like the hardcore, like screaming bloody murder, like that type of thing. But, uh, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty eclectic. I've been known to turn on like nineties hip hop every once in a while too. So I'm a nineties baby. So yeah, I got you. Um, any eighties sprinkled in there? I, I'm a, I'm a big eighties so rock fan. Not All so right. much. I actually grew up uh, with some classic rock. So Ario Speedwagon, Kansas, super tramp, all that. My dad, I was on a huge kick on that in high school, but, uh, not to work out to for some reason. It just doesn't get me going. That's like driving down the road, you know, driving down the back roads in your car, windows down type of music. I got you. I don't even know if you normally listen to the podcast or not. Probably not. Most people don't, but uh, we have a little voting thing going on right now with uh, uh, people submitted their top five TV show intro songs. Uh, so I just need to re- read those results real quick. So if you don't mind bearing with me while I do that. Go for it. Uh, so, all right. Round three results. Uh, Laura Sturm defeated Chris Peterson. Don Dotson defeated Cindy Yeager, Stacy Metcalf, 
defeated Wesley Toller and Amy Pancake defeated Drew Cargill. So we're down to the final four. Again, the winner of this tournament does receive a $50 gift card from 110%. Round four matchup, Amy Pancake versus Laura Sturm and Stacey Metcalf versus Don Dotson. Voting is on Saturday on the Instagram page at PL Ballads Podcast and the stories. Don't forget to vote for that. Okay, we're back. The women. The women are crushing it. Yeah, they are. Um, I, I I got voted out round one. It's <laughs> that's just to spite you. They just didn't want to the win. It probably, you know, that's I'm gonna have to go with that because I I genuinely believe I had a great list and to to lose on round one is is uh it, it, there has to be more to the story. That sting, so that sting just a little bit. Yeah. Um. Uh, we typically do a powerlifting situation and a new lifter tip each week. Um, I didn't take the time to do a powerlifting situation this week, so we're going to skip that. Well, I think that can be the the hamstring tear. I think. I think we can go back to that question. Yeah, what that's do you true. Do we when can do you that. get injured, what do you do? Because I think a lot of powerlifters do what we talked about, and they just sit around and do nothing instead of being proactive about their recovery. Yeah, and I think even from a coaching standpoint, I think a lot of times. Um, Coaches are like, well, I coach powerlifters. Like, I don't want to deal with programming differently for this rehab. So just take a couple of weeks off. Yeah. And I think that's an injustice to people. Absolutely. Um, because that, I mean, honestly, like you said, you're back deadlifting. It, yeah, it's 135. But like, had you taken three weeks off and done nothing, like one, you wouldn't be deadlifting 135. And two, you would most likely have some scar tissue build up, which would be a whole nother issue that you'd have to work out before you could even get into position and probably pull the bar. So the biggest thing you can do is just move. I think. Yep. hundred percent. New lifter tip. Tell me if you agree or disagree. Don't forget to stop and smell the roses. People sometimes get so focused and detailed with their training and competing that it starts to feel like a job. Remember why you started and remember how much you enjoy the feeling of working out. Agree or disagree. Absolutely. That's why I power look, man, because I get to work out and do what I love to do every single day. And it is hard, I think, to look back and say, hey, I started, you know, well, I'm a freak and I started my bench press at 135. But, you know, why do you think it is? I I think a lot of women like upper body strength is always the thing they have to work the hardest for. Um, why are you different? So I always go back to when they first opened a YMCA in my hometown, I was going into the sixth grade, no, going into the seventh grade. And I was a cross country runner. So I ran and uh, I don't know why, but I got the idea that I should be lifting weights. So I would run down to the Y every day and I would do pull-ups, bench press, lateral raises and dips. And that's literally all I did. So I'd run to the Y two miles. I do all those things and I run home. And I did that probably three or four times a week. Um, same thing usually. Um, and I think that's where I I've always had a little bit bigger upper body, but I think that's where like my base started and I didn't lift legs at all, mind you, because I was running. So, you know, that's what I did for my leg, <laughs> nothing for my legs. But, uh, I think that's where I got my base to be honest with you. Cause I've always been a little bit bigger in the upper body, but, um, I also, my uncle was a power lifter and he was very, very good at bench press. So it could be partially genetic as well. And I tell people that all the time. I'm like, I have, you know, I can put on muscle in my upper body, like nobody's business, but you look at my lower body and it's like, you know, does that girl even lift? So it's, uh, I think it's a little bit genetics and a little bit, uh, it, I, I had a very solid base to start out with. So, and I love bench press. A lot of women hate bench press and they tell themselves that over and over again. And then that's why they suck at it. So. Yeah. And, and what is your effort level going to be going into something that you have convinced yourself you suck at and you hate, right? Yep. I had to change my mindset around squat, like very, very much. So like I had to tell myself every day for probably a year that I love squat and I'm going to be great at it. And I'm just now getting decent at it. So We need to talk about this. There's a decent number of lifters that I coach that have that one lift that they quote unquote hate. And they they keep telling themselves that like, even, even like, as we're training, like, man, I hate squats. And I'm like, you got to fucking stop saying that, you know, you're, you're creating this whole reality for yourself and that's not real. Um, what do you tell people like that? Like, how do you, how do you get, and I'm asking your opinion because that's something I'm still working on. 
sort of like getting like a little, like those little cattle prods. Like I grew up on a farm. So like, we always had these like shock cattle prod things. Like part of me wants to just get one of those. And every time they say something, just like zap them, but I'm sure there's some liability and legality things with that, that (laughs) would frown, that would frown on that. But they do, but no, it, it's, they have to interrupt that thought pattern. And that's literally what I tell people. I'm like, every time you go to squat, you better say, God, I fucking love squat. This is the best lift ever. I'm going to be so good at squats. Like, and you just, I mean, even if you are lying at your butt, like it doesn't matter. Like you have got to stop. Like, cause if you go into every squat session and you say Fuck, squat day, I hate squat day. I'm terrible at squats. Like that's, that's what's going to happen, you know, and you have to interrupt those thought patterns when they happen and get used to doing it. So when you hear yourself saying it, you're like, nope, I love squats. Even if it's the biggest lie you've ever told in your life, like you just have to, you have to start getting that vocabulary where it needs to be in your head or you're never going to believe it. So it's, you have to talk about it, think about it, and then you can believe it. Like there's no, there's no other way around it. Yeah. And, and powerlifting is so mental. Like you have to get your mind on board. And if you don't, like, you're never like, you're, you're going to be spinning your wheels like forever until you get that. Like, yeah, you'll still make progress, but I guess that's the thing. Like, what do you want out of this? Like, do you want to just like casually get better or stay the same? Or do you really want to, you know, push your limits and see what you can do? And if that's the case, if if the latter is what you're trying to accomplish, like you got to get your mindset around that and, and on board with it. That or do it more do it more often. I think that's the thing that really tipped it for me was I started squatting twice a week. Like, Hey, guess what? I got better at squats. Like it's amazing. That doesn't work for everybody, but you know, it's very lifter specific, but it works for me. Uh, Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things like you see people posting like, you know, how do you bench more? And they post the answer bench more, you know, that is not always the answer, but there is that component. Like it is practice too, right? Like, yeah, we have a unique sport. Like our practice is our sport like so you know and and a lot of and our training for it is is our sport like most people lift weights for their sport or whatever like lifting weights is our sport um so i think a lot of people overlook the aspect of like the practice of it all because you know people take batting practice and then you lift weights later um to get stronger at, at baseball or whatever yeah that's a weird example but but you still have to practice your sport. So like if you are having a mental block with squats or whatever, like, yeah, maybe you need to go in and squat five times a week, but obviously you can't go heavy five times a week. And, you know, maybe you're squatting 50% on three out of the five days just to get the practice and the mechanics and the mental part of it, because there's so many mental cues that you need to execute during the lift too, to make sure everything fires in the right sequence and things like that. Maybe it's just, you need to practice those things more because it feels foreign to you because you're, you know, you're you're not executing in the right sequence or whatever it is. So. Oh, no, but I I think, you know, experimenting, like this is a, like you said, it's a practice. Like we have to, you know, we have to experiment. And that's why I tell my girls all the time. I'm like, look, I want your top set to be, you know, whatever position you fall strongest in. And then after that, your back offsets, tweak something, you know, spread your stance out a little bit, change your grip with, you know, try to tell yourself something to yourself a little bit differently, like whatever it's going to take, because your list will always be evolving. Like you're never just going to find that one squat stance that works forever. Like there, there will always be something that changes, whether something gets weaker or stronger, or you tear a hamstring or whatever, like things are always changing within your body. So you're never just going to get really good at squat. And now I'm always good at squats. Like it doesn't work that way, you know? And I think that's what people think is, oh, I found my one, my one squat stance. That's just going to be the Bible from now on. And I'm never going to change it ever again. And that's not, I mean, if you have that approach, you know, it's like we were talking about earlier, you're probably not going to evolve very far in the sport. I mean, there's, there's coaches that coach that way too. Like, oh, this, I, this lifter that, you know, squatted this huge number and this is how they squat. So all my lifters are going to squat that way. Well, that, yeah, that you, you might, you might find another, you know, needle in a haystack that that works for, but in general, that's not the, that's not going to work. So, uh, well, do you want to, you want to, I guess, plug yourself a little bit? What do you do? Where are you at? Where can people find you? All that stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am in Wichita, Kansas. I own a gym called foundations fitness. So if you're ever rolling through the ICT and you want to come in and get a lift in, let me know. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Kate loves to lift and, uh, yeah, I love some, 
some more teammates on my roster. I gotta, I gotta start following some more people on the team. I've been, I've been kind of unplugged, so I'm looking forward to to getting a little bit more plugged in. I gotta plug Stacy though. Stacy's my accountability buddy, and I love her. So she's a she's a good girl. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanna, I wanna get uh, more involved in the team and uh, help us grow and take us to the next level. And I just appreciate everything that you do. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, so one one clarification question. Uh, if you're rolling through ICT, what does that mean? ICT is our, our uh, uh, kind of our acronym. So that's our, our our airport acronym is ICT. Got it. Okay. Rolling through the ICT. We are the ICT, the 316. Got it. See, I, I hear that. And I almost like didn't quite hear everything you said after that because I'm sitting there thinking, what is ICT? ICT. <laughs> Got it. All right. Wichita's cool. airport. That's ICT. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Cool. Uh, well, I think that does it for this week. Um, appreciate you joining us. Uh, I'm sure you'll be back at some point. Awesome. Anytime. Thanks for, thanks for kind of keeping the, the semi on task today. Um, oh, we did a great I'm, job saying on task. We did, we did pr- pretty <laughs> decent. It would have been much worse if you weren't here because I'm, <laughs> I, I go off on talking to smart. yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like answering myself, like, I don't know. Should I do that? No, probably not. You should probably. <laughs> Please yeah. have me on. Don't, don't <laughs> talk to yourself ever again. Awesome. Will do. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, don't forget voting on Saturday at PL Ballads Podcast on Instagram. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can shoot us an email at PL Ballads Podcast at gmail.com. We'll catch you guys next week. Later. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode of the Powerlifting and Power Ballads podcast, please remember to subscribe and share it with your friends.